An honorable profession is brought to you by Tech for America, an organization dedicated to providing a platform to solve America's toughest public challenges. For more information, visit t4a.org. That's t, the number four, a.org. We're also supported by opencounter.com. OpenCounter builds tools for local governments that deliver permits and licenses online. Their portals make complex permitting simple, which lowers transaction costs, increases transparency, and empowers economic development. OpenCounter is a vital tool for communities big and small across the nation, including Atlanta, Charlotte, Oakland, Indianapolis, and San Diego. Check out opencounter.com to see what they can do for your community. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports some of the most thoughtful and innovative voices in American politics. I've been lucky enough to be a member of New Deal for years, both when I was mayor of Santa Cruz and now as chair of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Check out some of our past episodes with guests like Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, Lincoln, Nebraska Mayor Lyrian Gaylor Baird, and more than a dozen amazing leaders at the state and local level. You can find us at newdealleaders.org or wherever podcasts are found. And do me a favor. If you like what you hear, please tell your friends. We're trying to bring sanity to politics in an insane era. We need all the help we can get. Today, we have a special Colorado edition of An Honorable Profession. At a recent New Deal conference, we grabbed a few minutes with Governor Jared Polis. He is a successful entrepreneur, a strong advocate for innovation in government, and the first openly gay governor in American history. But first, we talked to two remarkable women, Colorado State Senators Carrie Donovan and Brittany Peterson. They are 40% of a group of women called the Fab Five. If you haven't heard of the Fab Five, you should. These are five women who've known each other for years, and in 2018, they all ran in swing districts for the Colorado State Senate. They flipped the chamber. This is a very special episode of An Honorable Profession. We have Colorado State Senators, uh, Carrie Donovan and Brittany Peterson. They are 40% of the Fab Five, uh, which is not just a rock band, but a uh, group of women who've known each other for a long time and uh, really supported each other and won uh, races across the state to flip the Colorado State Senate and enact a whole series of really incredible legislation during the last legislative session. So, Brittany, Carrie, welcome to An Honorable Profession, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, I want to talk first about your path into politics. Um, you know, are you all uh, people who have been thinking about running for office since you came out of the womb, or is this something uh, <laughs> that, that you came to later on in life? Well, uh, I actually never thought I would run for office. I I actually didn't even vote when I was eighteen, and I didn't. I was never raised talking about politics. I don't even think my parents voted. And so for me, it was actually, I came out of the Bush era when after he was elected and seeing the detrimental policies that he started implementing and the Iraq war got me involved. Uh, I started registering voters, working on campaigns. Uh, I still never saw myself running for office years later, um, but a seat opened up in my community. And most people say it takes men one day waking up and looking in the mirror and saying I can be president and it takes women being asked five times and I think it was more about 30 for me (laughs) but I eventually said yes and jumped into one of the most competitive races in the house Uh, that was seven years ago and just ran with uh, four other women to take back the state senate and what got you to say yes uh you know what what was it that that eventually got you to 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 flip the switch and jump in um, obviously, you were an act, you were active, but but to actually be a candidate's a whole new can of worms. I think that we need to change the face of the people who are running for office. Uh, I, like so many people, felt like uh, it was only people who came from uh, really wealthy backgrounds, had the perfect uh, life story, went to the right schools. Uh, I was a high risk youth. I. Um, 
I struggled a lot as a kid, uh, and it was really my public schools that changed the opportunities in my life, my ability to succeed and overcome uh, where I came from and, and change the likelihood of where I was uh, supposed to go. And so I think that coming from where I, I came from, I didn't even think that I would be hired in politics. It was always like people from Ivy League schools, um, people who whose parents knew the candidates. Um, and so I started actually on the Obama campaign as an organizer in 2008. And uh, I kept being involved and, and there was somebody who moved into the district to run. And I'm sick of the people who are more concerned with their titles and not what they want to do. And, you know, it was a community I grew up in, bought my house in over a decade ago. And I think that we need diversity in experiences. And uh, we need people who are elected that uh, that people relate to, that are regular people, and understand the, the struggles that most people go through. So I ultimately said yes, and that was the scariest moment of my life. And I'm so grateful that I did. And yeah, has it has it been what you expected? <laughs> and um, and how do you keep bringing your, you know, that experience as an as not necessarily an outsider because it's the community you grew up in, but uh, but as a as a person who's not normally in power to your to your decisions when you're making them. So I I, I being fr- you know coming from my background, I I see how that impacts policy every day for me and the way that I view the world and the impacts that what we're working on has. And I think that me being able to um, especially tell my story around the opioid epidemic, my mom, uh, she was overprescribed opioids when I was six and watching what she's gone through for the last 30 years and how broken our system is and the lack of opportunities for help and recovery in Colorado has really fueled uh, a lot of my work in that specific area and just having that personal experience being able to talk about my mom show her face um, have her come and speak about how broken our system is has completely changed the opportunities that we have in Colorado to ensure that we're actually getting people the help that they need and I of course brought that perspective with trying to help uh, some of the most underserved kids in our schools when I was on the education committee but I think you know, too many people are so out of touch with what real people face. And so I think that, I mean, it really defines the the work that you do on other people's bills, whether in committee, it defines the, the issues that you end up championing, uh, actually taking on. And so uh, I think that it, it's a critical piece in, in getting a diversity of, of life experiences for people who are elected. Thank you. I think it's so important what you're saying, and hopefully some real people out there are listening, and suddenly uh, this becomes an option for them. Uh, Carrie, you came from uh, a ranch uh, to politics, which is not uh, your typical path. Can you talk about your path into politics? Sure. Uh I was raised watching both of my parents serve on our small town city council, town council. And the conversations that we had around the dinner table at night weren't around, you know, the sitcoms or, you know, what book we were reading. There was about what was this town facing and what were the challenges that, you know, they were going to take on and try to fix. Very passionate, involved people in a town that was very new. So I grew up with the town of Vail and watched it go through all the struggles and decisions that towns have to make about their identity. I remember a trip up to Yellowstone, which was our summer trip. We all piled in a leprechaun Winnebago. Um, myself, two brothers, and my parents, five people in that little Winnebago. They are not like Winnebagos of these days. They were small little campers. Uh, and we went up to Yellowstone, and we drove through West Yellowstone, which is, um, if you haven't been there, you know, it's kind of the most touristy area, kind of in the Yellowstone area. And it was this gorgeous environment you had just come out of a national park and the town had neon signs everywhere and it was just such like a non sequitur and such an abrupt um, interaction and we went back to our home in Vail and I remember my mom typing on a typewriter the Vail sign code and one of the things she put in there was no neon signs 
because she just we just had this experience we talked about it as a family like as she had made dinner that night you know something like hamburger help or whatever you eat when you're camping and then we went home and she used that experience directly to impact the future of Vail and now when you go to Vail this world-class world-renowned resort you don't see any neon signs why because my mom made that decision and so it was incredibly empowering to see both of my parents um, just a full commitment to public service in their community and see the impact they had on this town it never got credit for it they you know it, it wasn't celebrated they didn't have a title they were just like involved community members and then I have um, incredible grandfather who I think I was cut from the same cloth and he was a World War II veteran served in Camp Hale which is foundation part of Colorado history and he always impressed upon me just the commitment of public service and if you get to serve your community or your country you say yes so I got a phone call asking me to consider running for Senate District 5 and I said yes and I then had to go look up a map of what Senate District 5 was <laughs> um, but the first response was a family value if you're asked to serve you say yes that is um, those are both great stories and it's nice to hear this different perspective. So talk about this group of women who uh, who had known each other and came together in order to uh, in order to flip a house and really try to reset some of the state policies in Colorado. So as we were starting to look at last fall, fall's election cycle, you know, months in advance, of course, because these were going to be big, tough, big campaigns for the state Senate. And it was to make a real effort at flipping the state Senate from Republican to Democrat. And I think we looked around and suddenly realized that the five seats that were going to be the hardest fought and the most important to flip, we had other seats we had to defend, Mm -hmm. but the five most contentious seats to defend or flip were these five women uh, that had known each other either through long-term friendships, through professionally, or we had supported each other in earlier campaigns. And it, it was almost, for me, it was this epiphany when I suddenly realized this, that there was going to be these five just remarkably wonderful, strong women who are going to take on one of the biggest challenges politically actually across the nation in that election cycle. And so it started off pretty casually, you know, um, sending supportive text messages, calling each other when you knew that they were experiencing something that you as another candidate in a tough race were probably the only person who could understand. You know, what does it feel like when you get bad press? What does it feel like when that negative mailer hits? And so it started out as, uh, you know, not really a plan. And then it evolved into this uh, Fab Five kind of um persona that was bigger than all of us and I think that was because suddenly it it was a group of women who were taking on this huge challenge and that doesn't happen and so it gained a lot of support um, nationally and within the state uh, to kind of gather around these five candidates uh, that I was just thrilled and proud to be a part of. It was it was really a remarkable, very organic thing that happened out of um, five tough races. And the support that was provided just by having really someone who was in the trenches with you uh, helped make some of the really bad days not quite as bad. Making uh, bad days not quite as bad is always, it's, a, <laughs> it's an undervalued uh, component. <laughs> Brittany, can you talk about a little bit, uh, you know, this is, it was, it was a relationship built on, first of all, shared values and interest in the future of your state, but also relationships. But then it became a phenomenon, you know, you're on the national news and uh, <laughs> yeah. in national media, and it's, <laughs> and it's, a, it's a bigger story. Um, what was that like to have sort of a relationship turned into a national story? That must be a... Um, uh, discombobulating experience yeah it was uh well first of all going through it together in the trenches not only you know having known each other trusted each other and had friendships before but but also when you go through really war in our world um, those are the people that you're bonded for life um, and we went through everything together, uh, even though we were separately going through our own unique challenges in our campaign, 
we were all a team. We did fundraisers together. We had, you know, uh, big names come to do fundraisers for all of us. And we were devastated at the thought of maybe one of us not making it. And so uh, on election night when all of us made it was the biggest relief and, I mean, the joy knowing what what that meant for Colorado and the work that we were going to be able to do, but also personally knowing that all of us made it across the finish line. Uh, and after we did that, we so it, we didn't come up with the name the Fab Five. It was actually supporters throughout Colorado that started to talk about us that way. Uh, so we always felt uncomfortable because you know the Beatles are pretty amazing. So, <laughs> uh, but I think that we we gave a glimmer of hope in a time where, uh, with Trump in office and what what the attacks a- against women at every level, and and what that feels like for us in this time, it's a, a scary place. And so women have stepped up in an unprecedented way, and I think that it was not just about us taking back the state senate but the fact that it was us five women doing it together and have you heard this model being replicated in other states or other places where you know it's a scary prospect to run for office especially a really contested seat uh people are finding these these support networks and sort of all for one one for all uh going after these seats I haven't heard of it, but I I certainly hope people are seeing that you don't have to be in Island Nation when you run a campaign. I I think um, one of the challenges of being a candidate is, uh, right, you you yourself, the person, is also the brand. And that's a hard hurdle to overcome when you are starting to go through your first elections, particularly competitive ones that bring with them negative campaigns and, um, you know, attempts where uh, the saying is you won't recognize yourself at the end of the campaign, you know. Uh, And so I think what was what was shown with kind of the the fab five that happened in Colorado is that you can still you can do both. You can run your individual campaign tell your goals communicate with your district while also still supporting other people that are in the race with you so i mean we um we all crossed the finish line together and we all won together you know none of us had to beat the other person across the finish line to have victory and a lot of times in politics there's this and i certainly think in in modern politics where we find ourselves today there's not a lot of um, it's an all or nothing paradigm Uh, and i think what we showed is you can have you really can have it all you can win your election authentically and um, being very true to your district while still supporting other candidates that are are in the same election cycle as you. I think that that support network is so critical just on learning as you go, being there for each other through the ups and downs. Uh, but we're, we're stronger when we actually work together. And we did that with our, our house seats, our overlap for our house races as well Uh, so it was really it was it was us as a team and it was also our overlapping races as well on how we were going to all get across the finish line in both chambers and for those listeners at home uh, we are in the middle of a uh, Colorado May thunder lightning storm uh, as we speak so that the the sounds you hear in the background are a remarkable storm uh, (laughs) hitting a city outside um <clears throat> so, we like to brag about our weather in Colorado, so I'm glad that it can be a participant in the podcast. It changes, uh, <laughs> yes. It, 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 change, it makes its presence known, and it cha- seems to change every 15 minutes. Um, so you got elected, and now um, you just finished the legislative session, and by all accounts, it was a, uh extraordinary session. Um, I wouldn't say it was easy, because uh, it was uh, hand-to-hand combat and took on a lot of big issues tell us about sort of you know winning the election is one thing governing is the is the next big step and that's what you were sent there to do what if what what did you take on in this session and what was it like now that now the fab five arrived in the capital so one of the things that i have um, come to appreciate immensely is that 
campaigning gives you the roadmap to what you should work on if you're being an authentic lawmaker. So going door to door is one of my favorite things because you talk to the people that you will have the privilege of representing and you're talking to the people that probably have other stuff going on in their life, like getting their kids to soccer practice or buying groceries for their mom who she just hurt her hip, right? Like we all have a lot of stuff that happens in our days and that doesn't always give people capacity to make a phone call to their local lawmaker to talk about what policy they need to work on. But after a campaign, you walk into the building armed with the issues you need to fight for. And what I heard door to door was healthcare. It was the number one issue at every door was the high cost of healthcare uh, and that it was just becoming too burdensome on most people's budgets their health care costs were mirroring their mortgages. So uh, walked in the Capitol determined to work on that issue, and we did substantial work on a very complicated issue. What was really neat about walking in there with another group of women um, and colleagues that got elected and we had connections with is there was kind of this, we weren't starting from zero of building professional relationships and trust and political respect. I mean, I already had all these colleagues that I'd worked with in the Senate and then new colleagues that I didn't have to go out to coffee to meet them. I knew them and I knew them intimately and I trusted them. And so I could go with them to policy, you know, conversations. I could count on their votes. Like I knew they were going to be, um, they were going to be on my side on working on policy because they had just been on my side in a really tough campaign. So that really, really helped. And uh, our session's 120 days. So from day one, if you have a complicated issue, if you aren't ready to go on day one, you're not going to get it done by the end. Mm-hmm. Which some things didn't get done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, that's the funny thing about politics. It goes from an individual sport in the election to a team sport immediately that if you can't get, get to a majority, you can't get anything done. So what are those issues, Brittany, that, that you you were able to tack, tackle in the session? Um, and then give us some sense of why it was uh, – you both are uh, have said you're tired at the end of the session. <laughs> you worked hard. Yeah. Uh, what made it what made it rewarding and what made it hard? I mean, I think people need to know it's not all it's not all victories. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that you know we had a uh, we had split chambers for four years, so we had the opportunity to take back the state senate, and we did so together. So we had a dynamic where the uh, Republicans were in a position where they no longer had the power that they did. Uh, they were adjusting to that. We also had uh, new people in leadership. We had some people that had never been in the majority before. We had new people. Uh, And then we also had a new governor. So everybody was kind of getting used to their new spots. And I think that that was the adjustment in the beginning of session. Uh, And I think that that's why things were kind of slow in the beginning. We all just came off the campaign trail. But it set a stage for us to get big things done that we worked on every year that went to kill committees in the Senate. And Carrie and I, we, we, every year we brought a bill for retirement security options for people who aren't offered that at work. I believe that they're actually talking about it right now at lunch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, every year it never got a fair hearing and Carrie had to be the one to carry that in the Senate and unfortunately go to a kill committee. And so this year we were able to set the framework for that for equal pay, so many bills that we worked on for for years that we were finally able to get through. The retirement security, it's so crazy. I mean, when do we become a country that didn't want to offer people who are working and just want to have <laughs> a retirement and because they're not they don't fall under a certain aspect of the tax code they uh they're they're opted out of that system it's crazy so uh so i know uh you also in addition to health care in addition to some worker protections uh and opportunities uh you also looked at environmental bills and gun bills um can you talk about those experiences yeah sure so uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, my day job is a rancher. And so one of the um, rewards and challenges of this session is, um, you know, when you have a split chamber uh, 
there is, and you serve in the minority, which is where I served for four years, you actually at times have a little bit more capacity and freedom to be a stronger voice for your district because uh, you may know that the the policy has uh, has a different pathway and so therefore you approach what you're going to do on the floor and you, the voice you know the opportunities that you have or the speech that you're going to give or whatever it is you know it's it's definitely a different strategy when you're in the minority and I'm actually still in the minority in some ways within even the Democratic Party in the Capitol because I come from a rural part of Colorado and we just have a slightly different challenges and culture and and whatever, right? We all know that that cities in the country are, you know, have have different cultural bases. So this year, I would say one of the challenges I've had is, um, you know, the the Democratic Party largely speaks more often for urban metro areas. It's where the Democratic party is has stronger footholds and so there were some bills that were tougher for me because they they had broad wide support across the state you know polling numbers that are polling numbers that you can't even ask for right you know 70 plus 75 plus like issues that by and large are the right fit for colorado but my district might not quite be there yet so that was a challenge of this this session um so while supporting the work of my colleagues, uh, I was also the bills that I ran, you know, were very specific for my district and, you know, am grateful that my colleagues repaid the favor and, and voted for some bills of mine that were very specific for rural Colorado. And so together, you know, we were able to pass quite a bit of um, legislation that really will um, change Colorado going forward. There's just an article in um, the Denver Post that says 18 ways the Democrats will change your life. And if you can't, I mean, that's what you want at the end of session, is that you pass laws that will positively impact the people's lives in the state and the district that you represent. Okay, can I ask you a follow-up, which is, you know, this urban-rural divide uh, is a big challenge for it's a big challenge for the country. It's a big challenge for the Democratic Party. Uh, it's certainly a challenge for the people running for president, including two Coloradans uh, who are who are in the field currently. There seems like there's new ones every day. So who knows who else will jump in? You know, how do you? How would you recommend that the that the party? Um, start to bridge that divide and start to be able to talk because we should we should be able to speak for the entire country and not just um, ur- around urban issues. So, yes, I think this is an important discussion to have. What I will say is I get so frustrated by seeing like one more, you know, democratic rural initiative or one more stakeholder group or one more breakout session on it. And continuing to talk about how are we going to talk to rural Colorado while you're sitting in a conference room or at a convention. It's not that hard. If you want to talk to rural Colorado, you just drive out to rural Colorado and you chat with them. I think the importance and what people miss in this debate is for rural communities or any any small town, you just need to go up and show up and talk and listen and you know understand where they're coming from. Which should not be hard to figure out because whatever issue you want to you want to work on, right? It's very intuitive that you go visit that place. So if if you want to learn about homeless veterans, go visit a homeless veteran shelter. If you want to learn about rural Colorado, just drive out to rural Colorado and meet meet him face to face. But I think the showing up and showing a genuine intent to listen is all the Democratic Party needs to do to quote unquote crack you know, this, this divide. Um, and I think too, I, I don't think the divide exists as much as, um, people that advocate from division versus unity, uh, make it out to be right there. There is certainly a political philosophy right now that if you divide people up that you can have success. I think that's cynical. I think it's a very dangerous place for the United States democracy to be in. And so it should take every one of us that are committed to the future of America and the future of democracy to not let division be where we focus and instead focusing on 
the topics and issues that that unite us um, from the biggest philosophical ideas of liberty and freedom down to the smallest ideas of you know tax credits for new teachers like um, there's a lot there's a lot that we can agree on and work together on that's a great message Brittany tell me about you know a good day that you had in this session where you were able to move something that made these tough elections well I think that a a challenge is when you are fighting tooth and nail at the Capitol and it is I mean it was it was a very difficult uh, session because we have a small majority in the Senate and we had Republicans who were using every tactic possible to slow us down to stop progress and and ultimately trying to kill our bills and you know some of those long nights on the floor trying to remember the impact the the small sacrifice it is when you look at the actual impact that it makes for regular people and what we're able to do in that building i mean it's different work than being in a nonprofit where you see the people that whose lives you're impacting and so i'm um, trying to remember those individuals and and how how the policies are going to make their lives better is uh what i try to remind myself of when we were there till 5:30 in the morning, and <laughs> you know, uh, but one of the um, some of the most rewarding bills that I've had the opportunity to work on over the last few years has been packages to address the opioid epidemic, uh, because it's an area we know it is is such a it's the number one cause of death for people under 50. It is an actual public health crisis, uh, and everybody likes to talk about it in their opening day speeches and talk about it, uh, you know, it's a talking point. But far too few people actually prioritize and fund those priorities and make it uh, a focus. And so it's been a significant gap in Colorado and I've had the opportunity to really try to fill some of those areas. So uh, knowing that we we are leading the nation in the policies that we're bringing to help people move towards recovery and and to fight for the people who have been left behind every step of the way is some of the most fulfilling work that I've done and in, in, including this year. Um, but honestly, even the work that finally getting to pass the policies that we care so deeply about, like retirement uh, security options, that we knew was the right policy for Coloradans and was going to make a huge impact on Colorado in the years to come, actually getting the opportunity to pass those. I mean, it's, you know, we haven't had that bill signing yet. And um, and I think that those are the moments where now that we can sleep a little bit, <laughs> where we can really look back and reflect on the work that we've done. Because you're kind of in survival mode for a lot of it. You're barely sleeping. It's, inc- it's very, I mean, you're just, you're stressed out. It's you're carrying a, a lot of weight every day on trying to get these policies passed. And so I think that uh, in the in the upcoming months, we can all kind of take a deep breath and really look at what we were able to do. I guess that's, uh, Carrie. Okay, uh, I would just love to add to that because there was, uh, there's wonderful moments um, in the session. And there was this one where we'd had a pretty contentious day, a lot of debate on the floor, um, A lot of, you know, the parties taking their time to enunciate their values and illuminate the differences between the parties, right? That's why we have two parties, because they have different values and goals. Uh, And we need both parties. But I, after a contentious day, I had a health care bill up that had been one that I'd been working on for multiple years and hadn't been able to quite get the concepts and the ideas in it across the finish line. And so finally, we're at the moment in the bill's life where senators have to raise their hand, yes or no, on it. And then if you gain enough votes, then they ask for co-sponsors, which is kind of an extra level of endorsement on a bill, right? You can vote yes on it. And if it's really like a policy that's like, this is a great policy, then you co-sponsor it. And so I got the bill passed, and then they asked for co-sponsors, and all these Republicans raised their hand along with my Democratic colleagues. And it was just such an incredibly wonderful moment after this day of hard debate 
and and talking about what makes our party different uh, to get a bill passed and then get it supported with you know the majority of your colleagues um, who you know all have senator in front of their name and so to get that type of endorsement was a really wonderful moment this session yeah and even even bills that ultimately I mean the the bills that are the most rewarding are the ones that you fight hard for and you get bipartisan support I think that make the biggest impacts and Mm -hmm. uh, but also we we finally passed uh, the ERPO bill which is known as the red flag bill to actually create a process for people who are going through a mental health crisis for them to have their guns taken away temporarily while they you know are are going through this state Uh, and it was it was very contentious partisan and at the end of the debate, I remember uh, multiple Republicans coming up and giving me a hug and saying, good job, I'm proud of you. Even though I don't agree, <laughs> I don't agree with you, I think that you did a great job. And just kind of that, those relationships that you build in the Capitol that are, I think, so important regardless of what, if we don't agree ultimately, that we're able to actually work together and respect each other. It's interesting you got there because the the coverage, at least of the early session, was that it was it was not a place where people were giving each other hugs uh, and <laughs> congratulating each other. So it's it's good that sort of through the 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 battles, the legislative battles, people people developed a respect for one another um, and can, can come together. So um, recognizing that you need to catch up in your sleep and take a deep breath. Um, what's next for you too? And 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 what are you looking at um, for your state and and to help us restore some sense of normalcy to uh, to this country? I mean, what's next for me is um, definitely I'll go back to my ranch. Um, it's calving season for me. So anyone who's in ag, yes, I know it's late calving season. I move my calving season after session. Mm-hmm. So I, I will take care of a bunch of little baby calves for a couple months, uh, get back to building fences and fixing my tractor and um, planting all of our gardens. But I've already pulled bill titles for next session because uh, as soon as the as soon as the session ends, it's time for me to start thinking about what is next for my district and and what what do they need me to work on. So I already have some bill titles, and you know um, I'm always scribbling little notes to myself of you know this idea or that idea, and then you see what materializes. And of course, I'll spend um, the next month and a half or so reaching out to all the different parts of my district to see you know where did we hit the mark uh, where did we miss the mark what still is the issues that need to be solved uh, and that's what will inform my next session i think you know to your the broader question um you know that's kind of the the process of being a state senator is listening to your constituents and then working on the laws that will will help them but within that within the midst of doing that We're existing in a a different political universe that is directly impacts the ability of you to do the work of your constituency because we are in a place where um, compromise isn't valued. Um, Tweets and sound bites uh, rule the day. Uh, Echo chambers inform people's opinions of policy. And we have lost the ability to listen to opposing opinions, try to learn from and uh, learn from a conversation that is difficult. And instead, we retreat to the same people that agree with us online and let that be how we out how we act outwardly. I think that also hasn't um, it it doesn't give permission for public officials either to be a moderate middle, right? Because there, if if the echo chamber presents the views of the extreme, there isn't space for elected officials to exist or work in the middle. And so I think we all have a lot of work to do to relearning of how we talk and listen to each other and actively look for information that can broaden our knowledge of a topic. 
maybe your opinion doesn't change, but then maybe at least you can appreciate where someone else comes from and then understand why there might be a need for a compromise in the middle. Mm -hmm. And without that approach where we're all taking responsibility for the knowledge that we have on civic issues, um, I don't think we should expect the Twitter universe to uh, decrease in power. And right now, you cannot rule a country, a state, or a town with 140 characters. <laughs> Truer words have never been said <laughs> on this podcast. Um, Brittany, Which I will tweet about. Yes. <laughs> Brittany, what's next for you? Well, I just want to add, my Twitter, I actually don't have access to because it got shut down after my congressional run. So it's kind of been a, it was kind of a relief not to engage in those ways. So I appreciate Carrie's insight. And when she talks about the rural divide uh, with our urban areas, I mean, even with Jefferson County or the area that I represent uh, and people who live in Denver, uh, that divide is even, can be significant because I represent the suburbs. Um, and it's, it's just a different world. And I think that within our caucus, we have to be willing to listen to each other. And then also across party lines, we have to be able to listen to each other. Uh, so what's next for me? I, uh, I also do work training candidates, progressive candidates at the local level. Uh, so making sure that they have the tools necessary to succeed. And I'll be doing that work this year, uh, as well as running the opioid interim committee. I'll be chairing that. So continuing to build off of the work of the last few years and in, in building, uh, making sure that Colorado, that we can actually um, look like Ohio where we're cutting our overdo overdose rates in half, hopefully by the time we implement many of these policies next year. Um, and then I also have already pulled bill, tit bill titles because you know we all came off the campaign trail and while we had many policies that we had worked on before that we knew we wanted to bring again, we didn't have the time to take a deep breath and dive into some of these policy areas because we were in, in the trenches. And so it's a really exciting opportunity this year to, uh, to reevaluate what we want to work on as a caucus and what we want to work on individually. That sounds... It doesn't sound like a real break, uh, uh, but hopefully you can get a little sleep. And thank you both um, for, I think, not only the good policies you're pursuing, but for, I think, giving people a model for how to enter public life, um, both, uh, although you have different backgrounds and came to it differently, I think the way that you've the way that you've come to it and the way that you support each other, I think is a future. If we, if we want good people to enter a system that's not always friendly and easy, uh, it's probably, it's gonna look a lot more like, like how you did it than how it's been done in the past. So Absolutely. thanks for providing that. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was great to be on, thank you. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned, we grabbed a few minutes with Governor Polis between meetings. Here's our conversation about his path into politics and his ambitious agenda for Colorado. Governor Polis, thank you for joining us on An Honorable Profession. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today. Ryan, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here in, our, in beautiful Colorado. So I want to jump in um, first with sort of your path into politics. Uh, you started in business and moved into then Congress and, uh, and the governorship. And so why... Um, why public service when you had any number of options? It's not always an easy business. What makes what made you jump in? Well, business isn't easy either. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I started uh, my first company while I was still in college. Um, started a, a few successful ones along the way. Uh, took a company public. Uh, two other exits. Um, really, mostly in the internet space. Co-founded a uh, startup accelerator called TechStars and a nonprofit one called Patriot Bootcamp that helps train returning veterans to be entrepreneurs. Then back in 2000, uh, I was still active in business, but I wanted to give back part-time. And so I uh, ran for State Board of Education. And uh, one thing I actually, one of the reasons I ran is it was a six-year term. And I was like, I don't know if I like to run anything, but I'd really like to help support our schools. And so I, I won that and I was able to serve six years on there, which was just a great experience. Um, and I learned enough about education where I was able to then apply uh, kind of my entrepreneurial mindset to start and later be superintendent of a charter school network, New America School, which is, uh, operates five schools in Colorado and New Mexico, uh, helping new immigrants uh, learn English and get high school diplomas. 
Wow. And then, and then you caught the bug and kept going. Yeah, I, you know, uh, in terms of going full-time into public service, it was really 07 uh, when uh, my congressman, his name was Mark Udall, decided he was running for Senate. He was going to leave Congress. And so I went through this kind of soul-searching process. Do I want to go into public service full-time, you know, as opposed to just being on a board or, or, and being in, in education? And uh, I decided it was a great time. That was, you know, when Barack Obama was running, a very inspirational time to kind of go into public service. And so I ran for that congressional seat and uh, won and served a decade in, in the United States Congress. And now you've taken on the executive position as governor. One of the things that struck me was when I read about uh, your uh, State of the Union, or State of the State speech, opening up the legislative, you set out a really ambitious agenda. Um, sometimes politicians like to set low bars and then barely exceed them. What, what after all this time in, in, in office, have made you decide that you wanted to, to really set the bar high? Well, this was really a historic opportunity in Colorado. We had, for the first time in, in, in a long time, uh, Democratic Party control of the state assembly, the state senate, and the governorship. So we had a unique opportunity to move forward with a bold agenda. And I'm excited to say we got uh, most of it uh, done. Uh, full day kindergarten. Colorado only had half day kindergarten before parents had to pay for full day. This fall, we start full day kindergarten universally, free for everybody. We also expanded the number of preschool slots available. Uh, we also froze college tuition, and we uh, passed a number of bipartisan health care reform measures that will reduce costs and save people money. And so what do you think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Colorado's been a blue state and a purple state. Uh, when, we, when we're talking to voters nationwide about our, uh, the agenda that the Democratic Party can put forward, uh, what's the case you can make that Colorado's a example of what the future of the party is? Well, you know, we really ran on bread and butter issues and we're delivering on bread and butter issues. What, what does that mean? It means how do we save families money on health care, right? It's not about these ideological solutions on the left or the right. It's about common sense measures like hospital pricing transparency, prescription drug importation, reinsurance, uh, reining in out of network surprise billing practices. Uh, really, all, pretty much all of our health care agenda had bipartisan support. Um, that means, uh, in all cases, almost every Democrat and usually one or two or three Republicans. Some of them had more Republican support than that. But when we sort of transcended ideology, we were able to focus on delivering real results for people. And um, do you think that can translate into a, a national... Um a national campaign? Certainly you have a couple Coloradans. Well, certainly uh, there's a lot that the federal government can do better. I mean, like, for instance, with Medicare, they should be able to negotiate for prescription drug rates. Uh, Medicare basically pays list price. Um, we have another federal payer, the VA system, that is allowed to negotiate for prescription drug rates. Often it pays 30 or 40 percent less than Medicare. So again, that's not something that's really on the left or the right. It's more a matter of just taking on the special interests. But I would be thrilled if our presidential candidates really talked about and then delivered on simply letting Medicare negotiate for prescription drug rates. That, that, that alone would make a big difference. It seems, seems so common sense. It's frustrating. I was just talking to uh, two members of your Fab Five, uh, and they were talking about retirement security and the idea that it took so long and it took a Democratic majority to try to get to the place where you could have, uh, you know, treat, give people who are working hard an opportunity to, to have a good, secure, uh, secure retirement. It's... Um, it's I'm glad you were able to get there. It's just a shock that it's become a partisan issue. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I think we did a good job on the big issues working in a bipartisan way this legislative session. And, and what people always forget, too, is that now that the bills have passed, our legislature has gone home just last week. It's now up to the governor and the executive branch to implement all these laws. So we have our work cut out for us, whether it's our division of insurance, our health care financing agency, all of these reforms that have happened, uh, we now get to focus on uh, essentially not just doing the rulemaking on, but really working hard to implement in the right way to show people savings on health care. What's been the difference as you move from a legislative position to an executive position where you are focused on operations and running a running a state bureaucracy? It really gives you a more pragmatic lens because you as a legislator you're focused on oh what can we get them to do and on the executive side you're focused on what can we do either with existing authority or if we need to change something can we go back and change it uh, but you know we again we have the ability with the bills that pass to really deliver substantial savings on health care to uh, full day kindergarten is in the hands of school districts to implement the state doesn't have a we don't have to do a major implementation lift on that one we certainly work with school districts 
districts. We need to get out the checks on time, especially on the uh, implementation funds. But uh, we're very confident in our school district's ability to offer that this fall. And uh, you, uh, so you come from an entrepreneurial background. State government has traditionally not been a place that's been able to move quickly and uh, change structures. Are you, are you bringing some of that experience uh, to state government? And how do you think we need to adjust government to a world that's being disrupted more quickly, changing more quickly, uh, it needs to move faster. Colorado's now had two uh, entrepreneur governors in a row, uh, John Hickenlooper, who started a uh, brew pub in, in downtown Denver, and, uh, and now myself. It really is a state that lends itself to the entrepreneurial spirit, towards innovation, to disruption. We're really proud to be very future-oriented here in Colorado, and uh, we want to play a role in positioning Colorado to lead for the future. Well, Governor, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, And thank you for your leadership. Right, it's a pleasure. Hope to visit Santa Cruz someday. All right, thank you. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Row Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.